Welcome back to Now Let's Be Honest. I'm David Tate, and this is part 15 in our video series going through the Gospel of Matthew. Next week, we're going to hop right back into the narrative of Matthew and start talking about the Sermon on the Mount. But this week, what I thought it would be really beneficial for us to do is to actually look back on what we've covered so far and just talk about the narrative flow of Matthew chapters 1 through 4 and what ultimately it seems like Matthew was trying to accomplish in those sections. And the main reason why I want to do this actually goes back to the outline that I gave us for this book at the very beginning of this whole series. Uh, and I kind of admitted at the very beginning that people will debate on how exactly Matthew is structured, but from my own personal study, the most convincing argument has been that Matthew is structured uh, through a series of narratives and discourses, narratives and discourses, narratives and discourses that ultimately lead to this final section at the very end that is the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? And when we finish Finished, Matthew chapter 4, we have actually finished our very first narrative section. And what we're going to see with what Matthew does throughout this book is that each narrative is going to set up the following discourse, and each discourse is going to serve as like a, con a connective tissue between the two different narratives that bookend it, right? And so I think it's really important for us to look back at what Matthew has accomplished in these first four chapters in order for us to anticipate what's coming in the chapters to come. Because one thing that we really like doing whenever it comes to studying the Bible is we love just reading passages in isolation as if they don't fit into this grander narrative of the book. And you know what? I think you can read each of these stories and each of these sections on their own, but I think that they become a lot richer whenever you understand them in their original context, and you realize that the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is just one smaller portion of a grander book and a grander story that Matthew's trying to communicate. And so if we can understand what Matthew did with Matthew chapters 1 through 4, then we can kind of see, even to a better degree, why he includes the Sermon on the Mount where he includes it, other than just chronological reasons. And so, uh, what I've been arguing over the course of Matthew chapters 1 through 4, and you've probably gotten this drilled into your head over the course of the last few weeks, the last several weeks as we've gone through this, is that it seems to me that the main thing that Matthew is trying to communicate in these first four chapters is that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think that the main reason he'd be doing this is actually just a pretty straightforward reason. Uh, pretty much everybody agrees that Matthew is the most Jewish of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it's very evident that he is writing to Jewish people. And I'm arguing that his main primary goal is to defend the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's trying to convince people that Jesus is the Messiah and then lay out the implications of his Messiah ship. And you can go back way to the very beginning of the series and you'll see how I made that argument, both just looking at the structure of the book as a whole and also just how the book begins and how it ends. It seems like that is Matthew's primary goal. And so if you're a Jewish reader who is going into the Gospel of Matthew, you've got to realize that he's got a very short amount of time to really win you over, kind of like any reader reading a book, right? If the book doesn't start off strong and it doesn't fulfill its promises early on, you're probably not going to read the rest of it. And so if Matthew is trying to convince his Jewish readers that Jesus is the Messiah, right off the bat, he has to start laying down some credentials to demonstrate that Jesus has a valid claim to the throne. And I think that is what he's primarily doing in Matthew chapters 1 through 4. And so what we're going to do in this video is we're just going to go and recap the things that we have seen Matthew do to demonstrate that Jesus is the king. And as best I can tell, there are 26 main things that he has done over the course of this book. And it starts with these first 10. First off, he demonstrates that Jesus has the necessary credentials just in the very first verse of his gospel. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He points out that Jesus is the Messiah because he is from the royal line of David and he is a Jewish born son of Abraham. But if that wasn't enough, he actually goes on and in the verses that follow, he presents Jesus as having not only the necessary credentials, but he is actually descended from the royal genealogy through his adopted father, Joseph. And that's what we see in those first few verses that are the genealogy that typically we skip over because Nowadays, people just don't value genealogies as they once did. But if you're a Jewish reader reading this, this is the first thing you're going to need to know. A person can't be the Messiah unless he has the right credentials and unless he comes from the royal line of David. And so Matthew right off the bat is saying, yes, he has the right credentials. He's from the royal line. 
But then he begins to detail the narrative of Jesus' birth, and we see that his conception was miraculous, that his birth was announced by the angel of the Lord, and that kind of calls back to a lot of instances of stuff like that in the Old Testament. And then, even in his birth, we see that he is living out the history of Israel. And so, just like throughout the Old Testament, you have kings cropping up throughout the story who are in many ways living out the history of Israel, such as David, right? David is constantly going through situations that call back or call forward to other incidents that will happen in the life of Israel and in the history of Israel. So too, Jesus, even in his birth, is following in the footsteps of those other kings. He has this miraculous conception that is clearly an act of God, where a virgin is giving birth to a son. We have him being announced ahead of time like a royal proclamation. And then, once you get further into the narrative, Matthew begins to make these claims, and he says that Jesus fulfills prophecy. And over the course of the first four chapters, he is going to directly quote seven different prophecies that Jesus fulfills. But in addition to those seven direct quotations from prophecies, he's also going to allude to several other ones that Jesus fulfilled along the way. The first prophecy that he cites that Jesus fulfilled was that he was born of a virgin, which is a reference to Isaiah chapter 7. And if you're wanting to go more in depth into how exactly Jesus fulfilled that and whether or not that prophecy was messianic we have videos on that we have videos on every single one of these prophecies in this series because i've really been wanting to dive deep into those and explore the original context but then he keeps going and he says that even in his birth gentiles come to pay homage to him this would be super important to the original jewish audience because you've got to realize that the old testament theology regarding the messiah is that he isn't just going to reign over the throne of david and he's not just going to sit enthroned over israel but instead, we have constant passages in the Old Testament that talk about how Gentiles are going to come and pay homage to the Messiah, and they're going to serve God's kingdom, and ultimately, he is going to reign over all the nations. And this even goes all the way back to Abraham as well, right? Where God says, in your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed, right? And so you've got this idea that the Messiah is the king over Israel, but he's also the king over much more than just that. And Matthew points out that even in his birth, Gentiles come to pay homage to him whenever these wise men come from the east to pay homage to their king. And then he cites a second prophecy, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is in accordance with Micah chapter 5, that the Messiah would be born in the city of David. And Jesus was. And then, not only that, but even in his birth, kings feel threatened by Jesus. There's never a point in Matthew's gospel where Herod the Great hears about Jesus and says, nah, I don't, I'm not worried about the Messiah. No, instead, you get the idea that everybody's been anticipating the Messiah's arrival. And whenever King Herod, sitting on the throne, hears about the Messiah's arrival, he immediately feels threatened. And he thinks that he has something to worry about, which suggests that this Messiah figure born in Bethlehem has a legitimate claim to the throne hence why Herod's power feels threatened. And so just the way that other royalty responds to Jesus is an argument for the fact that he has a valid claim to the throne, because even in his infanthood, kings are threatened. Then there's a third prophecy. He was called out of Egypt. This is a citation of Hosea chapter 11, and we actually wrestled through that prophecy, and we talked about how a lot of the times people actually misunderstand this one uh, just because we're not usually very careful in how we're reading Matthew's text. Uh, but he cites this as a fulfillment of prophecy and that Jesus is doing this. And so even when Jesus is but a child and but an infant, he's fulfilling prophecy after prophecy. And it doesn't stop there. Moving onwards, he cites two, um, Matthew cites two more prophecies at the very end of chapter two. One is that Rachel's children were killed and that there was weeping heard in Ramah. This is a reference to Jeremiah chapter 31, whenever a lot of infants and children were killed as a result of Herod the Great's pursuit of the Messiah and the pursuit of Jesus. And so that was the fourth prophecy that Jesus has fulfilled. And keep in mind, at this point, Jesus is probably still under three years old, which is remarkable. Jesus himself hasn't even done anything yet. He is simply a passive figure in the story, yet he's already fulfilling prophecy. But it doesn't stop there. Matthew chapter 2 ends uh, the narrative of Jesus' childhood by mentioning Jesus and Joseph and Mary going to live in a town called Nazareth. And Matthew cites that this is fulfillment of the words of the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. 
and we spent some time talking about this one and how it seems to kind of be a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, but it also seems to be much broader than that. And it's talking about just a general theology of the Messiah presented in the Old Testament. And so if you were a Jewish reader, by the time you were getting to Matthew chapter 2, you are seeing that Jesus has fulfilled even in just being a child. He has fulfilled five prophecies. He had a miraculous birth that was announced by an angel. Kings fear him. Gentiles worship him. And the entire world seems to be flipping on its head. And this guy hasn't even done anything yet. And so when we go into Matthew chapters 3 and 4, the second two chapters there, you actually are going to fast forward about 30 years and you're going to see Jesus as an adult showing up on the scene and you want to see how things begin to change once he actually shows up. And that's exactly what Matthew begins to detail going into chapter 3. Uh, first off, we see that he was preceded by a forerunner who heralded his coming. Kind of like a king will send somebody into the land ahead of them to prepare people for his arrival, so too Jesus was preceded by this forerunner named John the Baptist, who came in and said, hey everybody, get ready, the king is about to arrive. But not only did this king have a herald, but this herald was a fulfillment of prophecy in and of himself. He was the voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord that was promised in Isaiah chapter 40. And not only was he a herald who prepared the way for the Lord, but the forerunner was an Elijah-like figure bringing out mass repentance. If you're a Jewish reader, this is going to be the thing that blows your mind because you realize that the Old Testament, the final prophet of the Old Testament, was this guy named Malachi. And Malachi said that before the Messiah arrived and before the kingdom of God arrived and before the day of judgment arrived, God was going to send the prophet Elijah to call people to repentance and to bring about this massive revival so that the people of Israel weren't destroyed along with everybody else who did not repent. And so the people of Israel were waiting for this. And so if the Messiah is going to show up, not only does he have to have the right credentials and not only does he have to be fulfilling prophecy, but he has to be preceded by Elijah. And Matthew says, Jesus was preceded by Elijah. John the Baptist shows up on the scene. He goes to the place where Elijah was last seen. He dresses the way that Elijah dressed. He says the things that Elijah says, and he does the things that the prophet said Elijah would do. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. And now that Jesus shows up on the scene, as a Jewish reader, you're saying, okay, he has the right credentials. He has the right forerunner. He's doing all the right things. He is being heralded as a king. What is he going to do? Does this king meet the right credentials and does he have the right character to be the Messiah? And Matthew's answer is absolutely yes. The first thing that we see Jesus doing is that he willfully identified with his people in order to fulfill all righteousness. He comes up to John the Baptist and says, I need to be baptized. And John the Baptist right off the bat says, you don't need to be baptized. He's making it clear. What do you have to repent for? You don't have to repent for anything. You are a righteous person but the king identifies with his people. And you go back to the Old Testament, and this is the highlight of the best kings. The best kings are not the ones who hold themselves up in a palace. They are the ones who stand at the gate and interact with the people. And what we see Jesus doing here is that even though he doesn't need to be baptized, and he should be the one baptizing John, he says, no, I need to fulfill all righteousness. He identifies with his people and passes through the waters. But in addition to this, he was publicly identified by God as the prophet, son, and servant mentioned in the Psalms and in the book of Isaiah as being the Messiah. This is probably one of the biggest ones because here we have God himself verbally identifying Jesus as the Messiah. He says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So not only is prophecy identifying Jesus as the Messiah, not only are Jesus' credentials identifying him as the Messiah, not only is John the Baptist identifying him as the Messiah, not only is Jesus' character identifying him as the Messiah, not only are all the miracles surrounding him identifying him as the Messiah, but God himself speaks and says, this is the Messiah. You know that son of God, the anointed one, the Mashiach you read about in Psalm chapter 2? This is him. You know that servant of God on whom the spirit of God comes to dwell, who will reign in righteousness and establish justice and mercy in all the nations? In Isaiah, this is him. God himself affirms Jesus is the Messiah. And then we see Jesus go into the wilderness and he is tested in the wilderness and he overcomes the devil. This is something that even David himself could not do. David being the pinnacle of Israelite kings, the man after God's own heart, even he succumbed to temptation, and even he bowed his head to sin multiple times, and his life was wrecked because of his sin. But not Jesus. Jesus goes out 
He goes out into the wilderness and he goes mano y mano with the devil. And he quotes scripture back and forth with the devil. And he learns the lessons that the Israelites did not learn. And where they failed, he succeeds. And he overcomes temptation and he passes the test. And eventually the devil has to leave. And Jesus comes out of the wilderness without sin. And this is has to be read in light of everything in the Old Testament where the wilderness is always identified as a time of testing, whether this be for Moses when he goes to the wilderness, whether it be the Israelites when they go to the wilderness, whether it be Adam and Eve when they're first kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they have to go out into the wilderness, whether it be the Israelites whenever they're exiled, whether it be David whenever he's in the wilderness, the wilderness is always a time of testing and usually people fail. Jesus goes into the wilderness and he passes with flying colors. And then, in those wilderness temptations, we get to see the things that make Jesus who he is. What is his fundamental character? What makes him tick? Who is this guy? What does he live for? What does he do? Does he function as normal humans do, or does he live for something more? And Matthew says that this guy is truly righteous. His hunger for the word of God surpassed his hunger for bread. Whenever the devil tempts him to turn a stone into bread, he says, no, I'm not going to do it. We see that he trusted God fully and refused to test him, which runs contrary to all the other human people that we've seen in the Old Testament who always succumbed to temptation and ended up testing God or rebelling against him in some way. Jesus didn't do that. And in addition to all of that stuff, he was fully devoted to God, worshiping and serving him alone. In this way, he did follow in the footsteps of his father, David, who turned neither left nor right, but was wholly devoted to Yahweh. David, though, was a sinner. Yes, he was devoted to Yahweh and never served another god, but Jesus, he did what David did and more, and he was fully devoted to God and worshipped no one but God, which then ultimately leads Matthew deciding a seventh prophecy that Jesus fulfills, and this is another direct quotation, he goes and he starts ministering in Galilee. And this is fulfillment of an indictment against the people of Judah that we read about in the early chapters of the book of Isaiah, where basically God says, hey, Judah, if you don't repent... I'm going to reveal Messiah. I'm going to reveal my Messiah to the people up north. I'm going to reveal myself and my Messiah and my king, the descendant of David, the descendant of Judah. I'm going to reveal him in the region of Galilee because you have rejected me. And that's exactly what we see Matthew doing in the story, right? Um, the people of Judea throughout this whole these whole opening chapters, they're rejecting their Messiah. King Herod tries to have him killed. Whenever John the Baptist, his forerunner, shows up, they have him arrested. And so Jesus goes to Galilee. And this is a judgment against the people of Judah in direct fulfillment of the prophecy given by Isaiah. The Messiah is going to first appear in Galilee. Those who walk in darkness have seen a great light. But then whenever he goes there and he begins to minister in Galilee, he takes, a, he takes up the same message that was preached by John the Baptist, by his forerunner, and he announces the kingdom of God, right? That's exactly what the forerunner said. Hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, the king, shows up and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he immediately goes and begins gathering fishers of men. If you go back and you read about fishers of men in the books of Jeremiah and Amos, you'll see that this is kingdom imagery where God talks about how he's going to send the Babylonian. And he's going to send foreigners to come in and they're going to be like fishers of men who take the people of Israel captive in order to bring them into exile and discipline them so that God can eventually bring them back and establish his kingdom. Jesus begins gathering disciples and he is fulfilling that, right? He's not bringing them into exile. He's bringing his people from exile in order to establish a kingdom. And then we see that Jesus performed miraculous signs. Not only did God verbally authenticate him, but he also gave him the ability to perform these various different miracles in order to further authenticate his ministry. And he starts going around and he starts planting little pockets of heaven everywhere he goes. And so if you're Matthew's Jewish audience, you're reading this and it's checking off box after box after box that Jesus is the Messiah. But then that's not where Matthew leaves us with. At the very end of Matthew chapter 4, we see that Jesus is growing in popularity and his words and his works attract Jews and Gentiles from all over. It's not just the Galileans who are coming to him. It's not just those from Jerusalem and Judea, but also people from Syria and people from all over, people from the Decapolis. They're all coming to learn and listen and be impacted by Jesus. That is where Matthew leaves this off. And if you're the original Jewish audience who's reading this, 
Jesus has checked off every single box. And of course, there are ultimately other things that Jesus is going to have to fulfill. But at this point, at the very least, four chapters in, the Jewish audience is locked in and they're realizing, whoa, this guy not only has the credentials and not only does he have the amount of witnesses needed to testify to the truth of his claims, but he himself is living testimony to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And that is ultimately what Matthew is trying to communicate in these first four chapters. And I think that he does a very good job of that. So that if you're the original Jewish audience who's reading this, by the time you get to the end of chapter four, you are locked in. And really, you're just wondering what's going to happen next. And that's that. That's exactly what Matthew is going to address in Matthew chapters five through seven. And we're going to address that in a second. We're going to kind of talk about what we should expect from the Sermon on the Mount and what exactly Matthew's next goal seems to be. And obviously, we just have to guess because I can't directly talk to Matthew and ask what his goal was, but just from studying the book, we can kind of figure out what it seems like his goal was. But there's one other thing that I do want to recap before we continue onwards, and that is the idea of Jesus being Israel throughout Matthew chapters 1 through 4, because this is actually going to be something that continues on through the entire gospel. Uh, I've made the argument that if you look at Matthew chapters 1 through 28, the entire gospel, it is structured to very closely parallel the structure of the entire Hebrew Old Testament. The way that the Hebrew Bible is structured is a little bit different than how we have it in our Christian Old Testaments. Um, uh, it's the same exact books, but just ordered differently. But it starts with Genesis, and the final book of the Hebrew Bible is actually Chronicles, right? And if you look at how Genesis starts and how Chronicles ends, you'll see that that's exactly parallel to how Matthew starts and ends his gospel. And in between, I have been arguing, uh, and I'm not the only one who's argued this, um, but I've been arguing that Matthew is presenting that in addition to Jesus being king, he is actually living out the history of Israel, but he is succeeding where they failed. And I'm not going to belabor these nearly as much in detail as we just did the points about Jesus being king, because I've already talked about each of these individually as we've walked through these first four chapters. But I just think it's really cool to look at these holistically um, as we reflect on it, um, just because it's just really, really neat. Um, and... As we've been walking through this just like slowly but surely through each section, you might think that it's a stretch what I'm arguing for here. But when you look at it all together, you'll see that it seems very intentional that Matthew is doing this. And so let's just walk through the narrative of Matthew real quick and let's see how Jesus' story has paralleled the story of the people of Israel uh, and how Matthew seems to be specifically choosing specific points in Jesus' story to highlight in order to point out that connection. So first off, his genealogy spans the history of Israel from Abraham to David, from David to exile, and from exile to Christ, right? So right off the bat, Matthew frames this entire story as something that reflects the history of Israel, right? I mean, the way that he structures his genealogy is pointing out Abraham, David, David, exile, exile to Christ. And so just from the early verses, you see that Matthew's pointing out, I'm structuring this whole thing in like, I'm structuring this whole thing with the history of Israel in mind. That is Matthew's own admission in that opening genealogy. But as we walk through it, I've got the verse references at the bottom here. And you'll notice that it literally is walking sequentially through the books of Genesis and Exodus. And where we're going to end at the end of Matthew chapter 4 is Exodus chapter 19 leading into Exodus chapter 20. Jesus' story begins with a birth initiated by the Holy Spirit. And that birth in Greek, the word is Genesis. So technically it says, now the beginning of Jesus Christ came about in this way, which is the first word of the Hebrew Bible in the Septuagint, right? Uh, so the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the first word is Genesis. This is where we get the name Genesis, the beginning, right? So his story begins with a Genesis initiated by the Holy Spirit. He is born by the Spirit of God, not by natural means, kind of like Adam. His miraculous birth was announced to, anticipated by, and accomplished through parents who had no business giving birth to a child, much like Isaac. He survives certain death thanks to a man named Joseph who receives dreams from God and goes to Egypt for the salvation of his family. Right? So just right there in the opening chapter and a half of Matthew, we actually have Jesus living through the history of the people of Israel, specifically in the book of Genesis, starting in Genesis chapter 1 and all the way through Genesis chapter 50. And Matthew goes very quickly through that part, and I think that's primarily because of the theological emphasis that Matthew's trying to make. Because as we're going to see, 
he's going to slow down and really start focusing on that Exodus narrative because ultimately Jesus is going to be the Passover lamb who delivers his people from sin. He is going to be calling people to a new Exodus. He's going to be delivering people from bondage and taking them into freedom and delivering them into a greater promised land. And so Matthew's going to slow down right here and start detailing the narrative of Exodus. His birth threatens the reign of a power-hungry ruler who kills infants in an attempt to preserve his own power like Israel and Moses, right? So we see in the narrative of Exodus how Moses has to be put in a basket in order to escape this ruler who is trying to kill infants. In the same way, Jesus is going to have to escape from Israel and flee to Egypt in order to escape the power-hungry ruler um, who is the new pharaoh. Herod the Great. Uh, but then this also is a picture of Israel as a whole because Israel is trying to, like, Pharaoh is trying to kill all of Israel and they eventually have to escape this power hungry ruler and be delivered from Egypt in the same way. But Matthew does this whole role reversal thing where whenever Jesus escapes to Egypt, he is actually escaping from the metaphorical Egypt, which is Israel. And Herod the Great is the greater Pharaoh. And so there's actually this bitter, dark irony where it's actually safer to be in Egypt than to be in the promised land because the promised land has become the new Egypt at Matthew's time period. And that's kind of what Matthew is arguing here. But then we move on. He is called out of Egypt by God in order to escape the power hungry ruler like Israel and Moses. This is going to the same idea of Israel being the greater Egypt. And Matthew even cites prophecy here. And if you go look at the prophecy in Hosea, it is a prophecy about the people of Israel being called from Egypt. And so this seems to be Matthew's admission that he is structuring Jesus's story as mimicking the story of Israel. He returns to Egypt, aka Israel, after the power-hungry ruler dies to deliver his people from bondage, kind of like Moses. And the language that we see Matthew employing whenever God shows up to, uh, whenever Joseph receives the dream and says, hey, the one who seeked your life has killed, has died. The one who has seeked your child's life has died. Arise, take your mother and your child, your, take your wife and your child and go back to the land. Um, that language is very similar to Exodus chapter four, whenever God appears to Moses and says, hey, the one who seeked your life has died. Take your wife and your child and go back to the land of Egypt to deliver the people. But then we see the baptizer announcing judgments upon the hard-hearted leaders of the new Egypt, aka Israel, who have kept God's people enslaved. So whenever John the Baptist shows up and he is pronouncing judgments against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this is very equivalent to Moses and Aaron showing up and pronouncing judgments against Pharaoh for his hard-heartedness. But then after being delivered from Egypt, Jesus passes through waters before entering into the wilderness for a time of testing. Jesus shows up on the scene and just like the people of Israel, whenever they left Egypt, passed through the Red Sea, so Jesus shows up and he passes through the Jordan River in order to go into the wilderness. After passing through the waters, the presence of God descends as God affirms their special relationship in the hearing of many. The people of Israel, they went into the wilderness from the Red Sea. And whenever they went through the Red Sea and came out into the wilderness, they came to Mount Sinai, where God's presence descended upon the mountain and began to proclaim his special relationship and intentions with them. The same, ex the same exact thing happens with Jesus. He goes through the waters and then the spirit of God descends as God himself pronounces their special relationship. But then, after passing through the waters, Jesus is guided by God into the wilderness for a time of testing, which is exactly what we see happening with the history of the people of Israel. As soon as they get out of the Red Sea, in chapters 15 through 18, and going on, really, up through the book of Deuteronomy, we are going to see that there's this intense time of testing for the people of Israel. And this is exactly what Jesus quotes during his time of testing. Every single time, the devil tempts him, Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, which is Moses recapping the lessons that the people of Israel should have learned during their wilderness wanderings. We see during this time period, uh, we see during Jesus's temptation here that as the Israelites were tested for 40 years, Jesus was tested for 40 days. As Moses fasted 40 days and nights, so too did Jesus fast 40 days and 40 nights. When Israel grumbled over water, over bread, Jesus did not. When Israel tested God, Jesus did not. While Israel turned to idolatry, Jesus did not. And like I already mentioned, each of Jesus' responses to Satan come from scripture reflecting on Israel's time in the wilderness. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 8, which is Moses talking to the people of Israel saying, hey, here's the lessons you should have learned 
during those events at the beginning of the book of Exodus and in the middle of the book of Exodus, right? And so it seems very intentional that every single thing that Matthew is citing is calling back to specific events in the history of Israel. Because keep in mind, there is a lot about Jesus' story that Matthew probably knew that he did not share. Instead, he is very intentional and selective with the things that he does share, and it's because all of these are calling back to the story that he is trying to communicate. Jesus, as the Messiah, is living out the history of Israel, but he is being faithful where they were unfaithful, and he is succeeding where they failed. And so after some testing, Jesus comes to dwell in a place where the kingdom of God is pronounced, which is exactly what we see after those initial testings of the people of Israel in the wilderness. They go through the Red Sea, they come to the wilderness, and they grumble against God time after time after time, but eventually they come to the foot of Mount Sinai where God announces his coming kingdom and he announces the covenant and he calls them a kingdom of priests. Jesus shows up in a place and he begins to pronounce the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Like God at Sinai, his appearance is accompanied by miraculous signs and a call to devotion. At the very end of Exodus chapter 19, God descends on the mountain and we see all these miraculous signs accompanying it, right? There's fire and smoke and lightning and all these crazy things. And then he calls the people to be faithful to him. And basically God proposes to the people of Israel and he calls them to be his bride and he establishes the basis for this covenant he's going to establish with them. That's exactly what Jesus does right here. He shows up in Galilee and he begins performing miraculous signs and he calls people to believe in the gospel, the good news of the coming kingdom. And so this is how Matthew is presenting the story of Jesus. And it's not going to stop here in Matthew chapters one through four. Instead, it's going to continue throughout the whole gospel where he is arguing that Jesus is living out the history of Israel. And obviously not every parallel is going to be perfect because Matthew is not fabricating the story. Instead, he is looking at a historical story about a genuine man who lived in history, who was the Messiah, and he's just noticing parallels and he's framing the life of Jesus in a way that loosely connects to the story of the people of Israel. So I'm not claiming that it's always going to be a one-to-one -one parallel because it's not because you would have to change the story of Jesus in order to do that. I am simply suggesting that Matthew, communicating to his Jewish audience, is speaking to them in language they would understand. And as an original Jewish audience reading this, who would be very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, they would not have missed this. They're reading this and they are seeing how Jesus is not only the Messiah, but he is the true Israel who is fulfilling all righteousness. That all being said, that's what Matthew did in chapters one through four. And now we have to ask the question, what's next in Matthew chapters five through seven? Because that was the opening narrative of Matthew. Now we're going to move to our first discourse where Jesus is going to show up and he's going to start talking for a while. Well, Matthew has just authenticated Jesus as the king, demonstrating that he has a valid claim to the throne. And if you're a Jewish reader who's reading this, I think your next question would be, all right, so this guy seems like he's the Messiah, what are his policies, right? If he is the king, what is his kingdom going to look like? What should we expect from this kingdom? Because you got to realize that during the 400 years between the Old Testament and the arrival of Jesus, people had a million different ideas of what the Messiah would be, right? And so now Matthew has presented a pretty good case that Jesus is the Messiah. Their question is going to be, okay, so what are his policies? What, like, what should we expect from his kingdom? Uh, is his kingdom going to be something we would expect to be consistent with the Old Testament? And is it something that we would desire? And I think the answer is going to be yes. But in addition to this, Matthew has gotten us from Eden to Sinai, right? He started in Genesis chapter 1, and he has gotten us to Exodus chapter 19, journeying from the creation through the captivity and all the way to the wilderness. And starting in Exodus chapter 20, you know what happens. God begins to pronounce the Ten Commandments, and he begins to give the law. The same thing is going to happen with Jesus. Just like God appeared on Mount Sinai and began to give the law to his people, so Jesus is also going to ascend a mountain, and he is going to begin to delivering the law to his people, right? And he's actually going to begin by quoting a lot of the Ten Commandments. And so we see that both Jesus as King and Jesus as Israel are going to meet their next expected progression in Matthew chapters five through seven, he has laid the groundwork. He's demonstrated Jesus is the king. Okay, well, what's his kingdom going to look like? What are his policies? What does he expect his kingdom to look like? He has gotten us from Eden to Sinai. Now it's time for the people of Israel to receive the law from their God and from their king.
And so that is where we're going to be heading in this next section, right? The narrative is we saw the authentication of the king, and we saw this chiefly through his genealogy, his birth, his predecessor, and his ministry. And now we're going to take the next step, and we're going to look at the authority of the king. And what we're going to see in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is that Jesus is going to detail the citizens that belong in his kingdom, the commands of his kingdom, and the way that he interprets the law, the culture that he expects in his kingdom, and also the character of his kingdom in general. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we go into Matthew chapters 5 through 7 and the Sermon on the Mount, which is without a doubt one of the, if not the single most famous sermon of all time. And we're going to get that started next week. So I hope that you're excited for it because I know I am. I hope that this series has been a blessing to you. And I hope that you're not only beginning to get excited about the Gospel of Matthew, but you're also attaining a greater appreciation for the structure of the gospel as a whole. And you're beginning to hopefully understand why Matthew is doing things the way he's doing them. And obviously we can, like I've already mentioned earlier in this video, we can only speculate about this. I do not know Matthew personally. I have never met him. All I can do is study his book and try to make my best educated guess as to what he's trying to accomplish with each section. But I think if we think about this from the perspective of the original audience, it makes the most sense because you're just having to figure how do like if I was a Christian trying to defend the faith to a Jewish reader, what were this, what are the different things I would have to answer? And I think that's exactly what we see in Matthew's gospel. He is giving a Christian manifesto where he is defending Jesus's messiahship. And now he's going to defend the perspectives and the policies that Jesus has in his kingdom. So we're going to start talking about that next week. I can't wait to talk about that with y'all. Until then, my name is David Tate. This is Now Let's Be Honest. Be sure to keep a smile on your face. Don't let anybody steal your joy. And I will see y'all on the flip-flop. <laughs> God bless. You read a verse, you sing a hymn, the money's in the plate. Sundays you mark out for him, but even then you show up late. You bought the shirt, you wear the cross, but sin throughout the week. Thirty shekels and a noose, you kiss him on the cheek.